narcissists don't attach themselves to people because they have so little value. They attach themselves to you because you have so much value. And they've gaslit you into believing that you don't have value. It's the biggest scam of the world. The truth of the matter is that they will take themselves down to take you down. You talk about how to ethically manipulate a manipulator yeah. with a, um, a phrase that you called slay. What is slay? How we break that down and how we can use it to actually take our power back. Yeah. So slay actually is a, an acronym that I came up with so that people can remember it. And you start off with having a strategy. I know people want to go right to L, which is leverage. They're like, <laughs> give me leverage. <laughs> right. Yeah. But you really have to have a strategy and strategy is where you have a, a, you create a vision. And where am I going with this? That's your GPS. I, I call that your North Star. Mm. And then that becomes, you know, your, your, your focus for the entire thing and in the negotiation. And then you can create your leverage. And then A is anticipating what the other side is going to be doing the entire time and, and, being two steps ahead of them. And then Y stands for you, focusing on you being on the offensive and also your mindset. And 100% of winning is believing that you can and believing that you have the power to win. So many people, they feel, you know, when I, when I tell them, start with a strategy and I say, where do you want to go with this? They, they go, well, I want, I want them to, to stop. I, you know, they're getting away with all their lies. They're doing this. They're doing that. It's so hard for people to stop looking at the other side and what they're doing. And they can't even think about what it is that they want because they're just so in the defensive mode all the time. They've been so conditioned to be in this place of, of, of defense constantly. And, you know, and it's normal. It is so normal. And, and that is the one thing that, and, and I always say normal in the sense that it's familiar. It's familiar to be conditioned to be in this place. And, you know, I talk about in the book that, you know, you're in trauma, you know, a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And, and so to, to stop and give yourself grace and, and understand that that is where you are, but to think about what it is that you want is so, so important because if you can't be really, really clear about what it is that you want, then you can't go there. It's sort of like, going and sitting in your car and thinking about, okay, where am I driving? And you have no idea where you're going. You're not going to be able to get there. So you've got to be really, really clear about what you want in a negotiation or you're not going to be able to get there. And so I know so many times when you're in a toxic situation now, and I'm talking about professionally or personally. Mm -hmm. And, and the reason why I know how difficult it is, is because I've been there and I was in a, a professional relationship, you know, with a business partner, uh, an entrepreneurial situation after I'd already been in a, career as an attorney for 20 something years, I got into an entrepreneurial situation and it, it disempowered me tremendously. And I felt a lot of shame around that. And I felt disempowered in that. And I thought, how am I going to get out of this situation? And that's what led me to this whole thing. But, you know, if, if you can't create that vision, then you're not going to be able to figure out where it is you're going to go. So I call it like your GPS. It's like you're punching it in. You know, if you want to go from LA to Phoenix, you got to know, how am I going to get there? So that's the first thing, your vision. And then you can create action steps. You can go, okay, here's what we're going to do to get where I want to go. And then 
that's when you can start building your leverage. That's when you can start figuring out my, you know, your next steps. Okay. Thank, that's so, first of all, I just want to applaud you for being so honest about the fact that after 20 years of being an expert, I mean, like literally you're like one of the top freaking attorneys. So everyone on the outside might go, you must know everything, right? And it's like, no, actually you're human. And so I think that that just allows people listening right now to just almost take away the shame that they may be feeling that they've gotten trapped in this relationship or that they've given their power away, right? So like it can happen to anyone, a freaking badass like you who's so damn powerful, even you can let your power go um, over time with people that can be manipulative. So you actually just said, before we get to um, L, you said about how there's different types of narcissists and how that you negotiate with them differently. I'd love to kind of go through each one and almost identify what are the languages that they use and then what are the language we can use to them in those situations? Yeah. Well, one of the things I definitely want to make sure that people understand is that people, narcissists don't attach themselves to people because they have so little value. They attach themselves to you because you have so much value, right? Because that's where they get their value from. Correct. Yeah. And that's why they're desperately trying to cling on and stick with you. And they started conditioning you from the beginning, from the beginning, you know, that during that, what they call love bomb phase or that, you know, idealization phase, they started conditioning you from the beginning to see if you were going to be a good match for them. You know, did, are, did, did they get away with you know, a la you know, ghosting you and, and you said, okay, this, this was okay. You know, that sort of thing. Did they, did they get away with not paying you back money or whatever it was? And you were like, all right, I guess it's okay. You know, that sort of thing, because they, they came up with excuses and you were okay with it. Mm -hmm. You know, so that whole phase was a conditioning phase. And, and now, you're kind of at this deficit where you have to sort of condition them back when you have to try to get out of that, right? And and so they're going to cling on to that form of supply. Mm. That's what they're going to try to do. And they've they've gaslit you into believing that you don't have value. It's the biggest scam of the world. It's a huge scam. Why would they be continuing to want to attach themselves to you if you don't have value? Yeah. Right? Thank you. That's so beautiful. And I love, I love that notion because, I, again, I think that we can beat ourselves up over how did we get here. Um, and so knowing that, I want everyone at home really right now to just remind themselves. Um, so you mentioned earlier about how you have the covert narcissist, the grandiose narcissist, and what were the other ones? Malignant. Malignant. Well, those are the three that I think are the, the main ones. There are many different types of narcissists. And there is even, you know, a healthy narcissism, by the way. There's a lot of different types of narcissism out there. Um, but, you know, those are the three that I think that most people kind of think about and talk about. Um, and I, you know, I'm not a psychologist, but the reason why I think it's, it's, it's a good thing to understand sort of the basics of it is because if you can't understand that, then, uh, th then you, you know, you can't understand how to negotiate with them. So you need to understand sort of the basics of it so that you can understand how to build that leverage and build, um, your plan for how to negotiate with them because they each act differently in negotiation. Mm -hmm. And you have to be, that's sort of part of the A in anticipating how they're going to behave in negotiation so that you can stay two steps ahead of them in negotiations and build your leverage. Right. So if you don't mind breaking those three down. Yeah, so a covert narcissist t tends to be more of the passive aggressive, the humble one, the one that looks like the victim. You know, they on the surface, they look very kind, compassionate, humanitarian. I think they're the stealthiest. I, in some ways, I think that they're the, the, the most dangerous in a lot of ways. The grandiose narcissist is more of the what I call the garden variety narcissist, the one that everybody thinks of as a narcissist. Frankly, 
I think most attorneys don't understand what narcissism is. I, I don't. I don't think most people in general understand what a narcissist is. I thought a narcissist was a male blowhard, big you know person who would fill the room, come in, tell everybody how great they are. If you know, if they brag about themselves, a uh, misogynistic kind of guy. That's what I thought a narcissist was, frankly. I didn't know a narcissist could be a female woman who would be, you know, seemingly wonderful to the rest of the world, who, you know, had this sort of uh, ability to have plausible deniability on everything that they do. And, and that's, but they're very much every bit a narcissist. Mm -hmm. Which is what a covert narcissist is, and but you know, it doesn't mean they have to be female. But it, you know, that is a, a covert narcissist. So you know, they could be humanitarians, they could be pastors, they could be doctors, lawyers, whatever, and they save what they're doing these passive aggressive sort of techniques just for their targets. So the types of things that they do, it could be inadvertently leaving you off an email and, you know, oh, I, I don't, I was wondering why you didn't show up to that business meeting, you know, that I had without you, um, mm. you know, that sort of thing. And, you know, suddenly you're feeling less than because this person is smiling in your face, but doing these things to make you feel less. And that's what you mean by plausible deniability, where they're like, oh my God, I just didn't, I didn't mean to leave you off that email. I, didn't I forgot mean. to invite you to my birthday party. Correct. Mm. Yes. So they, I, I call it clean hands. You know, in, in law, there's this thing called clean hands that, you know, they try to keep their hands clean. Mm. But there, there's always this way that you can't really attach themselves them to it, but they're always sort of doing things that, you know, are passive aggressive, or they'll say things to you like, wow, it, it's really great how you've lost weight. Um, I mean, too bad about the stretch marks, but you know, you're, you know, you certainly, you know, look better. Um, or they might couch their, um, their, they're, they're the things that they're doing in care. So in a divorce situation, for example, if they're planting the seed that they might leave their spouse soon and they might want to be setting up their spouse for some sort of a custody battle, they might say, you know, six months before they're leaving their spouse, they might say, you know, I'm really getting concerned to a neighbor. They might say, I'm so concerned about Johnny's drinking. You know, he just had too much to drink last night. But, you know, I'm just, I'm just concerned about him. I think he's just under a lot of stress. I'm just concerned, mm -hmm. you know. And, and then six months later to the same neighbor, you know, I think Johnny is an alcoholic. You know, will you testify for me mm. against uh, him? You know, I, you know, I've been saying for months that that he has an alcohol problem. You know, I, I've been concerned about him for months. Now, Johnny probably has no problem with alcohol whatsoever, but they couch it in terms of concern. Mm. You know, and and they make it seem like they're just so caring. Um, and, and that's the kind of thing that they do. Wow. Okay. So I'd love to go now through, uh, you said that was the covert narcissist. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the grandiose is just the person in the room that's really loud, that is very charismatic. Right. Now, when they get into um, the discard phase and you go to negotiate, they will act very differently because, you know, they will... The, the covert narcissist is going to tend to line up those flying monkeys. They're going to tend to do that, what I just explained to you, go get people on their side, get their armies, get their, you know, whereas the grandiose narcissist might tend to file fraudulent motions, go directly after a person, file things that are um, straight up lies. 
you know, that sort of thing. Whereas a malignant narcissist is the type of a person who might stalk you, might actually, you know, act, go after you in, in, in a way that's much more uh, heinous. So, you know, knowing the type of narcissist that you're dealing with is very helpful in dealing in creating the leverage that you need to create. Oh, okay, thank you. I, I'm loving this. Okay, so now go into the L, the leverage. How do you start to create leverage depending on which narcissist is in your life? Yes, so important, so important. So here's what I figured out. All narcissists are driven by one thing and one thing only. That is narcissistic supply. Now, this is something that I found to be very, 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 very fascinating. Regular reasonable people are driven by many different things. You know, it could be um, having a mission of helping people. It could be having, um, you know, you 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 want to take care of your children, you want to take care of your family. You know, it, it could be a ma many different things, right? With narcissists, they feel totally and completely empty inside. And so they it, it's like this sieve, it's a black hole, it can never be filled. And, and so you might want to fill it too, and they might want you to fill it, but then you're left feeling totally and completely empty, and yet they're still starving. It's scarcity to the utmost extreme. And so they need an endless form of this supply. Mm -hmm. And so they are constantly looking for it. Now, there's two tiers to this supply is what I've figured out. There's what I refer to as diamond level supply. And then there's what I refer to as coal level supply. So diamond and coal, mm -hmm. right? So diamond level supply is what the world sees. They will protect and defend this form of supply to their death to, for anything above their children, above anything. It's how they look to the world. It's impressive friends, money, money, whether it was ill-gotten by cheating or whatever, they don't care. Um, the big houses, the impressive job, whatever it is. Then there's what we call that coal level supply. That's tier two. That is manipulating people, degrading people, treating people poorly, making people squirm, all that sort of thing. That's like that, what I call the dark underbelly of narcissistic supply, making themselves feel better by pushing other people down, okay? Now, there's this huge myth around narcissists that narcissists just want to win when it comes to negotiating. That is totally false because it totally forgets about coal level supply. It only takes into account diamond level supply. That's why they constantly move goalposts. That's why you can never get anywhere. The truth of the matter is that they will take themselves down to take you down. They will do anything to continue to hold on to that all forms of supply, including coal level supply. And so you have, in leverage, you have to figure out a way to threaten a, that form of supply that's more important for them to keep, which is that diamond level supply, than, this, than the supply that they get from jerking you around, which is that coal level supply. Mm -hmm. And that's how you build your leverage. And Ideally, you're going to have many different ways of doing that. So through documentation, you can create summaries of their lies, or you can figure out a way to expose them through, threaten, threaten, you know, to whatever it is that you can do, but you can't actually expose them or do something because if you do, then your leverage is gone. But if you don't do that, then you're never going to get free.
And how do you then identify what that leverage is? Because I assume each person each is going to be slightly is, unique. Each person is slightly unique. You just have to know what it is that, that you know, knowing the person, knowing what it is, mm. you have to figure it, you have to figure that out. Knowing what their diamond is. Knowing what their diamond is. Yeah, so I actually heard you uh, tell a story about how um, there was a guy that you were actually defending and he was, um, I guess it was like, there was like two and a half million dollars or something that the wife wanted. And oh yeah, yes. So this was a guy who, <laughs> This is a funny story where we were mediating and at the end of the night, um, and he was a huge CEO of a huge uh, development company, but like the second largest development company in, in Florida. And he was like, it, it, even at the beginning when he was hiring me, he was acting like I was all like lucky that he was hiring me as his attorney. And he tried to get me to negotiate my retainer. And I was like, yeah, well, buddy, you can... Go hire somebody else if you want. Good for you for sticking to your guns. Yeah, he was like, is there any room in your retainer? I was like, no. But uh, you know, if you want to have me ease on down the road, go on. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so we get to the end of a 12-hour mediation, and he, we're about ready to sign, and he was about ready to have to pay, um, like, uh, uh, like, two and a half million dollars in alimony over time because it was a long-term marriage. And the mediator came in and said, hey, there's an interesting proposal from the wife over here. Uh, can I talk to you, Rebecca, before we present it to your client? Because this is kind of crazy. And so he brings me out into the lobby of the law firm and I said, yeah, and he said, she's willing to waive alimony, but your client has to do one thing. And I said, what is it? And he said, she wants your client to apologize for all of the things that he did during the marriage to her. Now, she was getting a lot of other assets, so she was going to be fine. Right. And I was like, okay, what's the catch? And he's like, no catch. She'll, she'll wave alimony. And I was like, okay. So I went in and told him. And, and he was like, no, I'm not going to do it. Because his pride to him was more important than giving that money. Yeah. Yeah. That's the diamond. Right. And, you know, he would rather you know, look like I'm the big man and I pay alimony and all. I'm not apologizing to this person. And she wanted to be able to go around telling everybody I got an apology out of him. And finally he gets up and he, with tail between his legs, he goes over there and he does it. And, but he didn't want to. And so was that her leverage then knowing that his diamond was the apology. He never wanted to look like that, but she knew that at some point that he would have to... Like how important that was to her to mm. get that. But afterwards, you know, when we were standing in the parking lot, I'll tell you a couple of different things that he said to me. First of all, he thanked me for doing that. And second of all, he also said to me that he was glad that I didn't cave on my retainer agreement, you know, at the beginning when he um, tried to re uh, uh, negotiate that, because he said, had I negotiated my retainer, that he would have thought that I was going to be um, weak on negotiating on his behalf. Mm. I mean, I'm surprised that he admitted that to you. Yeah. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, that's fascinating. So yeah. understanding the S, understanding the L, now let's go through the A. Yeah, so the A is a couple of different things. One is knowing how they're going to behave in negotiations. But the, also, the A is also knowing that how they're going to behave in negotiations as far as that they're going to be baiting you. They're going to be trying to trigger you. I would say that 
negotiating with a narcissist is like uh, getting arrested. Anything you can't, you say or do is is going to be used against you. And you know, I, I know you talk about you know in, in being emotionally sober, right? And and that is exactly what you have to do in you know, to, to, you know, uh, to the nth degree in this kind of situation, because, you know, for one thing, everything you put your hand to is a potential trial exhibit, Mm -hmm. whether it's a professional situation, whether it's a personal situation, no matter what kind of situation it is, you've got to be absolutely careful. So I always say use one form of communication And I really recommend that it be email. And this is assuming that you've left that relationship, correct? Right. I mean, depending on whether it's a, you know, divorce situation, a business partnership, whether it's a a, a boss, a colleague, whatever it is, be very, very careful because they will try to bait you. They will try to trigger you, you know, Um, and as long as they are getting supply, they're going to keep coming around. So they're going to keep trying to get supply out of you. And supply meaning that your response? Yeah, you, you know, any kind of response out of you, any kind of rise out of you, anything. So, you know, I, I come up with all of these different ideas on ways to not do that, right? So, you know, making a plan stand, like, you know, you have a plan, you you just ways that you can start taking control, right? So ways that you can start taking, turning that ship, writing that ship, because, you know, you feel from the beginning, like you're just, it's so overwhelming. It's so, you you feel powerless, you feel paranoid, you feel paralyzed. And so, you know, I I, I came up with this sort of like three-step process of step one, don't run, step two, make a U-turn, step three, break free, so that you can just sort of like think of it in baby steps instead of like all at once, Mm -hmm. because, you know, your first step is maybe just one little boundary. And if your first boundary is just, I'm going to say, I'm not going to be spoken to in a way that's disrespectful. And that's my first boundary. For today. Now, when you say that though, and I'd love to go through all the steps, but when you say that, aren't you going to then anticipate they're going to push back? A hundred percent. But you know, this is, you're dealing with a person who is um, emotionally not, uh, you know, like a two-year-old. And, and, you know, this is one thing I actually want to make sure that I do talk about, and that is their brain um, physiology. Mm. And One of the things that I learned in doing the research for this book is that how they were formed is during their childhood, they were exposed to trauma on a regular basis. And, you know, as human beings, when we are in fight or flight, our brain physiology is that our brains emit chemicals, hormones, things like that. So adrenaline, cortisol, all these, you know, our brains emit chemicals to prepare us to fight or flee, mm-hmm. right? So that we can be stronger or faster or that sort of thing. And and we start to, you know, get, um, you know, in this on a regular basis, if this happens continuously. And so with children who are dealing with trauma on a regular basis because there was a lot going on in the home, it can cause damage to the limbic system in the brain. Mm -hmm. And it can actually cause arrested development. And so what happens with narcissists or narcissistic people, and, you know, it is a spectrum, then what happens with narcissists is that when they are becoming adults, that limbic system part of the brain does not develop. And even though the prefrontal cortex part of their brain does. And so as they are presented with stimuli that causes them to feel slighted in some way or feel upset in some way or feel triggered in some way, that limbic system part of the brain is triggered. 
and takes back over. And oftentimes, sometimes they don't even remember what they're doing during that episode. And so you're dealing with somebody who's not rational, who's not thinking in a rational, reasonable way when you're negotiating with them. Mm. You know, so while it looks like you're having a conversation with somebody who's an adult, you're not. I mean, this is a person who's that limbic system, part of their brain, that what we call narcissistic injury has been triggered. And, you know, it's not a person who's rational. And so you have to deal with them in a different way. You have to. And, and that's what I want people to understand. That's what I think the world needs to understand. Not only is the narcissist not rational and reasonable when you're dealing with them in negotiation, also the target person has been it traumatized too. They're experiencing cognitive dissonance and CPTSD and mental fog and brain fog and all sorts of things because of ongoing gaslighting and ongoing trauma to their system as well. Thank you for breaking that down. That makes so much sense. So much sense. And I think that it, knowing that now, I think allows you to not necessarily talk to that person or the narcissist the way you would talk to somebody else. So going back to where you started, where it's like, look, it's just that one thing, right? The three steps that you were saying is that like, you know, you just want to like stop that kind of like that behavior. Um, and then responding though, they may respond very differently than what uh, an adult, you would expect an adult to respond to. Right. So the way I look at it is like a two-year-old having a tantrum mm. on the floor, right? When you're dealing with a two-year-old having a tantrum, they, you know, they look at parents and they go, well, last time I wanted my bottle or whatever, I just needed to scream louder and scream harder, and then they gave it back to me, so that's what I need to do. I just need to kick more, scream louder, and I'm just gonna do, keep having more and more of a tantrum until they give in. And that's exactly what you're dealing with, with a narcissist, and they're, you know, they're always the worst right before they're ready to give up. And so mm -hmm. you are just conditioning them back you have to take responsibility for yourself and you can't be responsible for them. And you have to be okay with baby steps and, and being okay with the fact that they're going to have a little bit of a, you know, a tantrum each time you condition them a little bit more and a little bit more, but it's okay. Okay. So I, I love this. So what are the things then as you're conditioning them, what are the things that are ways to disarm the narcissist and what are the ways that you're actually going to freaking aggravate them and really rattle them up? Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that I do suggest is I say fluff or favor vomit later. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> You know, I mean, use it to your advantage a little bit. So fluff up their ego, you know, like you're fluffing up a pillow yeah. and, you know, just throw lots and lots of compliments their way for the things that you want and then, you know, get something that you want in return. Can you give me an example? Well, like, you know, if you want them to do the QuickBooks or something like that. You know, you're so much better at it and it'll be done so much more efficiently if you do it um, than if I would do it. And, uh, you know, but don't say anything about you being good at it or mm -hmm. anything like that. Don't have any kind of sar sarcastic tone or anything like mm -hmm. that because I always say narcissists hear tones like dogs hear whistles. Like oh. even if there's no tone, like they hear tone, you know? I mean, like just... Something like that, you know, like if you want something, then ask them to do it like that, you know, because that way, you you know, you'll get something um, and then let them talk. A lot of times you can find out what they're, what is, how do you think that this should go? Well, how do you think that this should be resolved? Let them talk about it, you know, kind of plant seeds and let them kind of come up with the ideas. 
and, you know, don't take your ego out of it, you know, a lot of times, because if it at the end of the day ends up being resolved in the way that you wanted it to be resolved, but they think they came up with the idea, who cares? Yeah, I actually have a list of yours. So your, your Instagram's amazing, by the way. You have so many freaking tactical things. Um, and I pulled some from your your Instagram on the ways to disarm them. Um, and so anyone at home listening, they can literally write these down and use them if they need to. I'm sorry you feel that way. Is that like allowing them to feel like they've been heard? Yes. Yes. So there's a lot of different ways that you can disarm them, you know, and, and I, I, I like agree. I agree with you, you know, because you can say, I agree with you. I agree with you that that's what you think. <laughs> you <know? laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah. And they don't even realize what you're saying. They're just yeah. like, oh, well, great. You say you agree with me. Yeah, I agree that that's your opinion, you know. Right? <laughs> That's your opinion. It's so good. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I, I, I can see that you are dot, 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 like that you are upset. Again, is that like allowing them to feel like they've been seen? Yes. Yeah. I can see that you are upset. I can see that you are angry. You know, just I like things that are observing of their behavior because mm. then you are starting to take yourself out of it and you are starting to see them as a third person you know, almost as an observing as a third party, because then you are starting to take it less personally. Mm -hmm. Because once you can start to not take things personally, you are starting to understand that it is their issue and not your issue. You know, people treat other people in a direct reflection of how they feel about themselves, always. It never has anything to do with you. It always has to do with how they feel about themselves, good or bad. You know, if, if people treat other people well, it's because they feel good about themselves. Yeah, that's so true. Um, and then to pull up another one, um, that's an interesting perspective. Yes, it's an interesting perspective. Or I, 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 the other one I like is, oh, that's really great feedback. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. That's okay. <laughs> um, and then you also- I'll take that under advisement. <laughs> And then as we're going, because we're on the A for anticipation, there's another thing that you talk about, about how, um, like, the words actually would destroy them. And I think that this can be very, um, we can use this, I think this is very wise for us to talk through because I want people to anticipate if they use it, because you even said about the tone, right? It's like, look, if you're sarcastic, it's just going to set them off. And so yeah. being able to anticipate how you talk about it also allows you again to take your power back. Because now in that, those moments, you just know what words to use to get what you want. Right. Yeah. I mean, and thinking that you're going to win and they're going to see that you're going to win is not happening there's never going to be this idea that they're going to go, wow, you know, you're right. I totally get your side. I totally get your, that you are, to I, I see your side now. They're not going to have this epiphany mm -hmm. and, and, and get to that other point and, and, and you feel all that closure and acknowledgement. And, uh, you know, we, we talked about before we started on the, the, the four Fs and, you know, forget about telling them they're a, nar they're a narcissist, forget about closure, forget about telling, you know, getting them to see that they're wrong and forget about getting them to see your side, the four Fs. I mean, because those things aren't happening, you know, I mean, just move on. Mm -hmm. I think that's really useful, though, because we do want to be validated. And when you've gone through so much crap, whether it's a relationship for personal or business, you find at the end like, oh, if I just get the closure now, I can move on. But if that isn't possible with somebody who is a narcissist, I think it's so it's it's very wise to just know that because now you're not wasting your energy. And now maybe you can find ways that you can get closure in other ways in your own validation, right? And yeah. moving on and work, you know, moving past that, um, really then building back your self-esteem. But if you're always holding on to, I just want them to say they're sorry. I just want this closure, you know, it, it can really keep you stuck. 
So I love those four Fs. They're so freaking powerful. Yeah, I mean, you just have to think of it in this way. A person cannot give you something that they don't have. You know, I, 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 re I remember reading a story that Wayne Dyer had I had said one time about like going to a fruit stand or something and it's like asking for uh, like, I don't know, oranges or something. And then, oh, oh, but they don't sell oranges at that fruit stand. You know, it's like <laughs> yeah. asking for a person to give you oranges and they don't have them. Yeah. You know, like they just don't have the ability to give you that. You know, they just don't have it. Yeah, they were banana stand. You know, banana stand. Yeah, <laughs> they just don't have the ability to give you that yeah, because they don't. They don't. They feel empty inside, so they're they they can't even give themselves that kind mm. of acknowledgement or feeling of of value. So they're certainly not going to give it to you. Yeah, and understanding that I think is really important again for you to be able to move on. Yeah. Um, okay, and so. The words that you recommend do not say to a narcissist, or if you do it, they're just going to destroy them, yeah. the narcissist, and then there's, a, I assume, a big possibility of a lashback. Mm. Um, so you say, um, do not tell a narcissist, like, I'm disappointed in you, or it's your fault, or yeah. I'm busy, and I don't believe you, or goodbye. Yeah, I mean, you're not getting anywhere with that. I mean, and especially if you're trying to get to a resolution and you're trying to get... Mm out of this thing in a way that's, you know, um, to a place of resolution and be done, you know, be strategic. Mm. Yeah, I love that. Um, and so what words can you expect them to say to you as you start to navigate out of this, as you, like, again, going back to the anticipation, um, because I think that it's important to, I don't want to say put the armor on, but maybe just have your shield that you can protect yourself um, mm. for when they come at you, that it doesn't just then break you. Yeah, I mean, you can expect them to say anything that they can to try to trigger you. I mean, so and, and depending on how well they know you, I mean, if they are, if they've been in a personal relationship with you and they know your Achilles heel, they're going to say the worst things that they possibly can. So you've got to just be prepared to go, wow, okay, that's interesting feedback. Never defend yourself. Never explain. Never justify. Never overshare. I always say talk to them like you're reporting the news, you know, as, as little as possible. You don't need to defend yourself and, and go line by line by line. You know, you can just pick out the things you need to respond to and just respond to those. You know, I'm in receipt of your email. I will see you on Wednesday at three o'clock. But what if they do threaten like, so when it's a business, I actually can understand, right? Like, okay, you have to separate yourself, do it over email. But when it's something very personal, right? Let's say it's been a partner and they just know your vulnerabilities. They know your triggers. Like the deep-seated wounds that you've had from childhood that you've maybe told one person in your life and it's them. And they come to you being like, hey, I'm going to use this. Like, you know that thing that you don't want me to tell anyone? I'm going to tell the whole world. How do you work through that? How do you almost defend? I assume, like, you don't want to necessarily engage too much. But, yeah, how would you handle that situation? I mean, that's why I say don't defend yourself. Mm -hmm. Because if you defend yourself, then they're going to be like, oh, I know. They're, I just... Because they want you to defend. It's, it's, it's a sign to them that you're actually are very worried. Right. That they have still have the power over you. Right. Got it. Yeah. Oh, there's a thing. I found the thing. Yeah. They're going to run with that. And just remember that, you know, all that stuff, that's not trial exhibits. I mean, that's not, you know, those aren't things that they can, you know, if you, if you play into that, then, then they know they have you and now you're in it. Now you're in the mud. Now you're, the, now you're there, you know? I mean, so I would stay as brief as possible. Brevity is key because they hate that. I mean, you know, it's so funny. We used to have, you know, back when I was still practicing law, there was this attorney that I would, uh, you know, I was friends with and we all used to like laugh about him because he actually, you know, used to write 
entire, you know, people would write letters to him and then he would actually use a, a piece of stationery from his firm, dear so-and-so, no, and then sign his name to it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and it was so powerful, you yeah. know, to to respond back that way, and like it's so powerful to do that. Okay, but you actually said it's not a trial exhibit. Assume they have something on you, and let's say like in court, right, where it's like, oh, now they've got this something of you, photo, email, something you've written, something that whatever, and they're gonna put it in court which even if it's not court, inside your head, let's say the court is your friends, your family, like they actually have the proof. How do you advise your clients? Because I'm sure they're just shit scared about this coming out, everyone seeing it, the judge, the jury, their friends, everyone at home. Um, how do you talk them through not defending, you know, if it does come out? I mean, what I would do if, I, if I'm in court and I'm having to defend my client with something like that, the way I would always handle that what would be like, you know, you're going to, going to see this, da, 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 you know, and um, I, I would right out of the gate, like handle it before they get to say anything about it. And then I would control that narrative, you know? So like my client one time, when I had a client who had slashed my my. The, the wife's tires or something. And so I would say, you know, you're going to hear about how my client had slashed the wife's tires and da, 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 da. And so I had my client testify to it. What happened? Mm. You know, why did you do it? So it just completely took the, the thunder away. Control the narrative. Mm. Don't, don't, don't run from it. That's what I would do. Yeah, that's powerful. That's super powerful. Okay, before we move into the why, is there anything else we need to know about the anticipation? I mean, just the main thing is this is where you're going to, you know, when I say step one, don't run. Step two, make a U-turn. Step three, break free. Oh, yes, thank you. We never actually finished Yeah, that. I mean, this is where, I mean, it kind of these th those three steps go with the S, L, and A, and Y mm -hmm. in the sense that you are... I, I call it course correcting. You know, you're riding the ship, you're turning it all around. And so the, the steps kind of go with that. And, and as you're building your strategy and your leverage, you're also turning it around and you're, you're, you're starting to say, okay, at what point am I going to start presenting my arguments and, and, and weighing my risks and determining you know, uh, how can I start being ready to um, actually speak to this person and feel prepared to feel powerful, you know, and anticipating is also where am I going to do the negotiations? Is it their turf? Is it mine? What am I actually going to wear? How, what does my body language look like? What kind of clothing color, you know, am I going to, you know, how does that impact my, my mental state? You know, cause body language can also be m reading my body language, you know, reading their body language. There's so much that goes into all of that, but you know, a, a, a can be a lot of different things, but yeah. I, I, I want to know. <laughs> like, so let's go down that. So who's tough? Well, there's a lot that goes into that because home field advantage is a is a thing, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a power dynamic that also says, you know what, you're tough, you know, because. I'm not afraid of you. I'm not afraid to come to you. I'm not afraid to come to your lawyer's office, or I'm not afraid to come to your your office if it's a professional situation, right? And then by coming to your office, I can also read what's going on in your room. I can also see what's happening in your office. I can I can get some stuff that's happening over there. I can pick up some things by being in your turf too. So there's a lot of things that you get from being in, in the other person's turf. And if the person, um, the narcissist, let's just say in this situation, comes to your turf, does it also though open up the, uh, their ability to disrupt it? Potentially, yeah. Because then that almost becomes another power dynamic, right? I'm in your turf and I'm still gonna run I'm it. in your turf, I didn't show up. 
Ah. You know, that sort of thing too. Okay. Um, Body language. So as you were talking, literally like... so much with body language. Yeah, tell me. That's a whole other thing. I actually have a whole course on Oh my God, do you really? Yeah. Because I literally had a whole flash and I was like, okay, if you're meeting with the person, you don't want to be like all, you know, like hunched over and look powerless. And you've got the Wonder Woman stuff. That's actually a thing with body language, like standing powerfully like that, right? But yes, but a part of me wonders would that trigger them more because they're like, oh my God, you know, like... Would that almost allow, uh, f- trigger the narcissist to then want to uh, overpower you because you're coming in with strength? Authentic power always trumps their fake power. Standing in your power, knowing who you are, the way you walk in, just your air, your confidence is just, they will shrink from that. I mean, truly, just knowing who you are is, there's just something about that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they will feel that and they will sense that. But, you know, sticking out your hand, shaking their hand, using their name, you know, looking them in the eye and wearing something that makes you feel like a million bucks wearing a, a color that makes you feel good. You know, there's there's something powerful about that. Now, of course, if there's a domestic violence situation, sure. you know, I'm not, but, you know, I think there's there's something to be said for all of that. And thank you actually for giving that context. So a lot of what we're talking about is assuming that you're not in a very uh, physical violence uh, relationship, because I think that a lot of what we're talking about won't apply to that specific situation. Right. Um, but the, the hand thing and the look in the eye and saying their name, dude, like this is the shit that I freaking love. Because again, when the emotion that you're going through, when you feel like you've been manip- manipulated, and especially when it's been a long time, like if it's been years and years, or you feel like it's a business partner that you've like really trusted with your you know whole being and they've, you've let them into your life and you share finances. I mean, like you have a vision together and you build something like that's really intimate. And so in those moments where it's just, I, I just want to say, that's a heartbreak, right? Where you find yourself in a situation where like the, the you actually see that the wolf is just in sheep's clothing, it can be heartbreaking. I've been through that, especially in business, and it is actually heartbreaking because I wear my heart on my sleeve, even in business. And so once you've got that emotion and you're trying to do this breakup, it's very hard to not bring that emotion into it. And so I'm, that's why I love tactics like that, where it's, you know, look them in the eye, shake their hand, you know, don't be uh, demure, like with your, you know, hunched over. Um, and then wearing the clothes that make you feel powerful. Because when you said, like, what colors are you going to wear? I was like, oh, shit. Like, I never even considered that. Oh, there's a that. whole thing on clothing color psychology. Like, mm. yeah, I mean, a whole thing. And, you know, and if you feel like you want to, like, scream in the shower beforehand or vomit or whatever, but, you know, like, cry in your pillow behind, you know, do it Go all after. Go to a after. kickboxing class You do beforehand. it after or whatever <laughs> beforehand, you know. And, and in my new, um, I, I have this master high conflict certification course. Like, I teach people how to do tapping and, you know, somatic breathing and th- things like that to help you feel better while you're, you know, to get through this. But during those moments you be in your power. Mm. You stand in your power. Do not let that person see you sweat. You know, you stand in your power. That's so powerful. Um, Okay, so now let's go to the why. Yes. So the why is really two parts. The first part is being on the offensive. So a lot of times when you are in negotiating, you don't, a lot of people don't start off on the offensive position. They feel like, oh, I, you know, I don't want to fight. I want this to be amicable. But that's reasonable person thinking, <laughs> right? I, I just explained the physiology of their brain. With a narcissist, you're either for them or against them. And if you're against them, you're public enemy number one. And so you're not getting that. Even if they say to you, oh, yeah, I don't want to fight either. That's not what's happening. And so you end up behind. You end up behind, you know, because they are behind the scenes 
doing things, lining things up against you, and then you're on the defensive, right? So you have to stay on the offensive. You have to. If you don't want to fight, you want to. You want a good resolution. You want. You want to come to a reasonable position. You have to stay on the offensive. You have to. Um, so that's you on the offensive, and then the other part is the a hundred percent of your of winning is your mindset. You know, I, I used to say eighty percent, but then Bob Proctor, um, he, <laughs> I was like, no, 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 no. it's a hundred. He, he corrected me, and I was like, you know what? You are so correct. <laughs> it is a hundred percent of of winning is your is your mindset, and you know, if you don't believe you can win, no one can help you. No one can help you. You know, you don't need like a good attorney. You don't need this. That. that is all giving your power away. You know, you need to just believe that you can do it. You can do it. I mean, it, it, you have the power. You know, what you think you become. I want to go back to actually to what you were saying about the offense thing. So how do you become an offense? Like how, what, what do those acts look like? Um, because my personal natural inclination is absolutely to go on the defense. Yeah, it means come right out of the gate doing whatever you need to, to take care of yourself. Don't go, well, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm going to wait and see what happens or I'm going to, not play, be the bad guy. I don't want to, I don't want to fight, you know, so it might be different for whatever situation you're in, but, you know, file whatever you need to file in court or take care of yourself, you know, whatever it needs to be. Don't hang back. That's my point. What if they start to threaten you though with things like, so for kids, right? I think that that's a big one in especially marriages. Yeah. It's usually a bunch of crap. I mean, you know, every time I've had those conversations with people, oh, you know, you're never going to see your kids again. You're not going to get the house and whatever. It's That's just crap. I mean, the law is the law. Mm. I actually met a woman that came up to me um, fairly recently, actually. And it was, it was a heartbreaking and heartfelt story all at the same time. And she came up to me, she'd seen an episode with me and Dr. Ramani, and she said, thank you, you saved my life. And she realized that his diamond was the house. Mm. And so she, he was threatening with the kids and he would threat, threaten to um, harm the children if she ever left. And what she realized was, oh, his diamond was just a house. So she was like, I didn't care about the house. So she just took her four kids, moved to this tiny little one bedroom apartment. And she's like, I've never been happier. Oh. But to your point, though, it's like she could have fought that. Um, but kind of thinking about what you're looking for, going back to almost like the, the strategy, like what is that end goal? Like what right. is the thing that you're actually looking for? Um, and then... In that moment, I think she probably processed, right, the defending of like, no, but I should keep the house. I should, right, the, the kind of things that you think. Mm -hmm. um, but then when she started to just weigh the risk versus the reward, she's like, the risk of losing the house versus the reward of never having to be emotionally abused again um, right. was her deciding factor for her. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you should all over yourself, right? You should, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, is there anything else that we need to know about the why before we move on? Well, I mean, I always say like that you and you alone define your value. People will think what you tell them to think. And explain that actually, because I heard you say it's so powerful. Yeah. I had um, a situation one time where I was actually, I had been a lawyer for about eight years and then I had um, gone to work for um, Morgan Stanley for a little while as a, um, as a, a, a broker, you know, and I had an opportunity then to go back to practice law because a friend of mine was leaving the uh, area and she was like, you know, I, I have a small caseload and I'm willing to give them to you, my cases, if you want to start a practice. And I thought, well, you know, nobody's ever going to be dropping a practice in my lap ever. And this is my opportunity to start a, a law practice. Now, I was in Naples, Florida, which is a very affluent community at the time. And I thought, okay, 
I'm going to do this, but I was so worried that the people of Naples, Florida, which is a small but affluent community, uh, were going to think I was such a flake. And so I was talking to my business coach and I said, people in here are going to think I'm such a flake. First, she was a lawyer. Now she's a, a financial advisor. Now she's back to being a lawyer again. And I, and my business coach said, people will think what you tell them to think. She said, you can tell them to think that you're a flake, or you can tell them to think that you are the only attorney in town that has a financial background. So therefore, you're actually more qualified than any other attorney, uh, family law attorney in town. So which story would you like to tell? And I was like, hmm, maybe I'll tell that story. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what I did. And within two years, I had one of the most thriving family law practices in the state. And I was representing billionaires and celebrities. And I had a very, very thriving practice. And you know, I was, um, you know, representing people who very clearly weren't going to be hiring a flake. Mm -hmm. But had I been apologetic and I'm sorry and showed up like, oh, I, I know I, I'm kind of a flake. I shouldn't have done that. You know, that's what people would have seen me because people will think what you tell them to think. But I chose to stand in my power and was like, I'm the only family law attorney that has this background. I'm more powerful. I'm more, th this is who I am. And so people came to me and was like, I'm hiring you because you have this, you know, so people will think what you tell them to think. Mm. I think that's so beautiful because even in that story I just told about that woman, right, leaving her husband, she could have told herself the story of like, I can't believe that I got myself into this situation. I've spent the last 30 years of my life being, you know, emotionally and physically abused. Um, but she didn't. Like when I spoke to her, her story was, I'm a badass that left that relationship. I was like, fuck you, yeah, woman. Like, and just thinking about it's the same woman, it's the same freaking story, but the story she was telling herself before she found, you know, my content was the fact that she was, that she was stuck and that this was the life. And she even said, I thought that I made my bed and I had to sleep in it for the rest of my life. And then by just making that shift, she did it, right? It wasn't me, she made that shift. But then that shift then allowed her to feel so damn confident and powerful after having left that relationship. And I'm not saying it is easy. God, Jesus, I am not dismissing anybody's story. Um, but I do believe in the power of the mind. Like yes, you said, the 100%. mindset part of it. Yeah. And so if anyone's listening to want to try and overcome their experience, to overcome that hardship they've gone through, the toxic relationship, whether it's a partner or a business relationship, what is that story you're telling yourself? Because even myself, um, my ex, uh, one of my business uh, people that I've been in business with, total narcissist. I mean, reading your book, it was literally like a script oh, no. of the narcissist. Like literally, the freaking Baden woman. <laughs> oh, no. Like step by step. I was like, well, I wish I had this book because I would have spotted it. Well, if I had this book, I'd be like, hang on, it sounds like this, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I didn't have the book. And so I was always beating myself up going like, oh my God, how did I like not see it coming? Yeah. I thought they were so charming. Um, but now I just give myself the grace and I, hey, look, you didn't know any different. So there's right. that. Um, and then the story that you tell yourself, right? It's like, oh, well now I, I can see it. And now I'm more powerful for having been through that experience because yeah. now I can see the signs. Totally. And that's why I love doing these shows with people like yourself because it's it's so revealing. And right. again, we were in, like coming almost full circle of where we started. It was like, how do we take our power back? Right. Yeah. I mean, we take our power back by first of all education mm -hmm. like this, and you know, first of all, we say, okay, we get the education now. We know, and then baby steps baby steps and giving ourselves grace and saying, okay, we didn't know it's okay. And, and, but we can get out of this. And, you know, they, the narcissist by and large, they probably aren't going to get the help and support that they need because they don't think they need the help. Correct. But you can, mm -hmm. anybody who's listening, you can, you have the power, you can, little by little baby steps. I mean, there's so many thousands of people who've taken my courses, who've said, you know, 
you saved my life. And they've been in horrible, horrible places. I know there's so many people who listen to you that have said, you've saved my life, who've been in horrible places. So there is hope, you know, little baby steps. You know, that's why I say step one, don't run. If the first step you take is just to say, my boundary today is I'm going to just start with disarming them by just saying, today, my boundary is I'm going to be spoken to with respect. And that's something you absolutely have the right to demand. You know, I say there are certain things that are negotiable and there's certain things that are not. You know what's negotiable? Contracts, issues, terms. You know what's not negotiable? Your self-worth, your self-respect, your self-esteem. Wow, that's so freaking powerful. What up, homie? I've got something free and new to share with you right now. How often are you visited by that negative voice in your head telling you that you're not smart enough, that you're not good enough, experienced enough, not fill in the blank? One of the most powerful things you can learn to do in life is to turn that negative voice into your bestie. And I wanna teach you how to do that and so much more in my four steps to becoming confidence workshop. And guys, the most amazing thing is you can actually register for completely free for this workshop. So click the link on your screen and I'll see you on the inside. So powerful. Um, you also, I love your freaking acronyms, by the way. You also have another one that's super useful, um, that's cool. And so when times get heated, you can use the acronym COOL. You don't mind breaking that down? Yeah, so cool words is what I, I like to use, which is, um, which is C, chill out. So the first thing is when things get heated, you know, chill out. So take a breath, walk away. Go walk around the room, go walk outside, take a, you know, get some fresh air, go into nature if you need to, you know, uh, nature is so wonderful just to get in, you know, uh, get some fresh air. And, you know, I say box breathing is really, really good. Uh, you know, sometimes when we are uh, in stress, we actually don't breathe enough. Mm. We breathe very, very shallow and it doesn't, we don't get enough oxygen into our bodies. So just chill out, take a breath, right? So the next thing is starting to observe their behavior. This is just, the O? Yeah, the O, the O for the cool. Um, so just observing their behavior, just, oh, I can see that you're upset. I can see that, you know, you're angry. Um, you know, that observing that, you know, mm -hmm. observing it to them. Right. And then the next thing is observing the situation, you know, observing what's happening, it, just taking yourself out of it. Again, that third party thing, not taking it personally. Right. And then the, the next thing is the L letting their words go by you, you know, like, I always, I always picture it like dodgeball. When I was a kid, we, 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 we played dodgeball. So, um, you know, just like observe their words. Oh, there it goes. I just saw it, you know, um, and, and just let it whiz by you. And then the words, the words part of it is something like a power word that it becomes your power word or, or words, mm -hmm. right? So it can be like, you know, um, you got this or powerful or, you know, whatever it is that is like your mantra or something like that. And you can actually write it out. You know, back when I was doing uh, trials, I used to actually have my power words. Like I would sort of like write it on the top of my, uh, yeah, yeah. I would put like, just like a P for power or powerful or something like, just to like remind myself who I was, you know, mm. like, and I would just put it on the top of my trial notebook or something like that. I'd just look down and remind myself that I'm standing in my power today, you know, or so you, you, you can just have like a symbol if you don't want anybody to see, see it, but just reminding yourself who you are, you know, it could be a, a phrase. It could be, um, you know, I am, it could be an, I am statement, you know, I'm a winner. I'm victorious. I am, you know, because whatever you, whatever follows I am is, you know, an order that you're placing to the universe and just start pivoting into that instead of, 
you know, they always get their way or, you know, I never, I never get my way. They're always winning, you know, things like that. Catch yourself when you're saying things like that, because those are all orders that you're placing to the universe. You know, I mean, instead of doing that pivot and say, I am powerful, I am victorious. And if that feels like too much, you can just pivot it into, you know, I am starting to see the light. I am starting to, things are starting to go my way or whatever. But I like the words of like, you know, powerful or winner or, um, you know, something where you can just put like a word or phrase that is going to feel like a mantra to you that you're like feeling powerful, you know, like I'm, I've got this. Yeah. I love that so much. I love just even the P. I, um, I just have alarms on my phone with like little emojis, like a little muscle emoji. Like, yeah. Just, Come on, you got this, Lisa. Yeah. yeah. You um, go, girl. <laughs> so let's say you do all this work. The power of a narcissist, though, is to then lure you back. Mm -hmm. So you go through it and then you think, okay, maybe I'm out. But then they do the cycle back again. So they do the love bombing again. And then you, uh, the next stage is the devalue stage. Mm -hmm. And you actually talk about the three Ds that go with the devalue stage. And I, again, you're freaking, the way you break this down is so uh, just beautiful to remember as well. So that anytime people are finding this, like as they're getting out, because you're building your confidence all along the way, and then they kind of come back at you with a love bombing. Um, and then the cycle begins again. But you were talking about the three Ds and you say it's devalue, debasing and degrading. Yeah. Um, take me through those three, if you don't mind. Well, I mean, those are just examples of, of things that they do during the devaluing stage. I mean, it's just, you know, you start to see who they really are during that stage. You know, you start to see these red flags during that stage where things are not lining up, where things are not what you thought that they were going to be. Mm -hmm. And so it could be in a number of different ways. Now, all of a sudden, you know, where you went from 50 text messages a day to uh, why, why are you bothering me? You know, I'm so busy at work. You know that I'm busy. Why, why, why are you, you're, you're such, you're, you're clinging on to me, you know? Um, and I, you know, I don't know if I'm going to be able to see you this weekend. Um, you know, uh, you know, um, that, that sort of thing, you know? Actually, as you're saying that, do you mind sharing that story about the woman that went to China? Because this is exactly like in business. Especially. Oh, yeah. that I actually coached her. That was in a really, really interesting situation where she was in a uh, like a Fortune 20 company over here or something. And she was a CFO and had gone to like a, a Ivy League school over here. Mm -hmm. And they this company in China that was based in Hong Kong, actually wooed her to come over and told her that she would be CEO of China. And he wooed her over and told her that she could have anything she wanted as far as running the, the Chinese part of the company and that she could even have like the all these women's initiatives and things like that that she wanted to be able to have. And, and brought her over several times and said that um, she was going to be able to do all these different things in the company. So that's the and love bombing stage. Love bombing stage. And uh, she was really not looking to leave her other company, but he really made it so that she couldn't say no. So she signed a contract and... Her husband moved with her. She gets there and first week, there's no office really for her. They are like moving boxes out of this office. And she's basically told that she's not going to start with her new position right away. Now they start paying her the salary, but she's told that she's not going to start with her new position right away. And that this guy, who's the son of this billionaire family, doesn't even really have time to meet with her immediately. And 
So like two weeks goes by and she's like not even on the website yet. And she can't get in to meet with the guy. And then she starts being told that she's difficult because she's trying to meet with the guy. And, and that now it's being documented that she's difficult. And all this crazy stuff is happening. And, you know. And that's the devalue stage. Yeah. You're emailing me too much. You're being difficult. Yeah. And she still isn't in this position that she's being been told that she's supposed to get. She's being paid the salary. So she's getting the money, but she's not getting the position. And But yet she's now being documented in her file that she's a problem. And um, so she ended up contacting me to say, hey, this guy's a massive narcissist. Like, what the hell do I do? Because whether you're in business or not, that story really hit me because it seemed like she did everything right. She did everything yeah, right. Yeah, going to China multiple times, having a contract. And so then to then find yourself in that position, A, I thank you for telling me the story, uh, telling everyone the story, because I, again, want people to hear that it doesn't matter where you are, who you are. Like it can happen to almost pretty much anybody. Yeah. And so this woman is like highly educated and she did everything like on paper, exactly what you would, I would tell somebody. Well, go check out the place first. Don't just say yes. Make sure the contract is airtight. Um, and so even in a relationship with someone's like, you know, it feel, felt like they were the right person. They were telling me they loved me. They introduced me to their parents. And then like a year later, you find out actually they're married with kids. Yeah. And then you start beating yourself up over how did I not see this coming? How did I end up here? Um, how did she process that? And then in hindsight, what would you have done differently? I mean, in that particular situation, I don't know. I mean, she did everything right. I mean, I guess she ended up negotiating something through lawyers and she ended up getting out of it. And she ended up starting her own business, by the way, where she ha she's helping women executives oh, and things amazing. like that. amazing. Yeah. I mean, so she's, it ended up fine for yeah. her. But, you know, she But she went, found, found value, though, in that situation by did. using it to then help others. She, she did. I mean, but she went through hell. Of course. You know, um, I, I, you know, but... She sure knows the signs of narcissism now. Mm. And that's in the language and the things they use. So like almost identifying it in the love bombing stage. Like mm -hmm. if someone is too over the top mm -hmm. and it's like, <clears throat> here's the problem though. When you feel badly about yourself, like I'm just going to speak for myself and the insecurity comes and someone's like, oh my God, you're amazing. You're like, ha ah. You know, like it makes yeah. you feel good about yourself. So right. it's very hard to go like, is this fake? And like, hang on a minute. Are they, you know, are they just trying to manipulate me? Like it, it, you don't want someone to be so standard offish but at the same time identifying the love bombing and then realizing or um, breaking it down to say is this like warranted like how do they know I'm this good well if somebody is too good to be true and you know just too much too fast too overwhelming and then when you start to see these red flags they always have because you do see the red flags right at the beginning you do but they always have sort of an excuse for them, like a, 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 a like a, some kind of something to say about it right at the ready. Mm -hmm. Like there's, you know, and they, they kind of like dismiss it and they have like something to be able to say, you know, like, oh, you know, let's, uh, let's not look, let's not look at that. Let's not, let's not um, think about that. Like everything else is so great. You know, I mean, I saw red flags right at the beginning in my business situation and I did even say something about it, but you know. To somebody else? No, no, to the person. Oh, what did you say? Well, I mean, I, you know, I saw that there was some copying of me on, mm -hmm. on her website, you know, of things that I was already doing. And I did say something to her and she was like, oh, no, no, I know, I know. I had already said something to my husband about that and I'm not going to do that or whatever. And, I, and it's like you just want to believe in the good. You want to believe in the good about people. You know, I just think that we want to believe that people are inherently good or we want like, so I think in that moment you want what you want 
with that person. You, you want to have a relationship with that person in that moment. And you think it's going to be so good. And so you don't, you don't want to believe that that red flag is, is what it is. And so you kind of turn that red flag pink or whatever it is, and you kind of dismiss it away. You bat it away yourself. And I think that I would never do that again myself. Yeah. Oh my God. You have literally dropped so many tactical bombs in this episode. Where can people find you? And then even more amazing stuff in your book. Yes. So my book is Slay the Bully, How to Negotiate with a Narcissist and Win, which you can get at slaythebully.com and everywhere. And then um, my YouTube channel is uh, Rebecca Zung ESQ. And then um, my Instagram is Rebecca Zung. And, you know, my website, of course, is that is that too. So thank you. Keep watching to learn the signs you are being manipulated. I've heard you even say, like, marriage should be like a lease. You have to renew it every 10 years. I, <laughs> I was like, oh, you know, I mean, would say that. <laughs> I still believe that. I mean, my friend Sam and, and Natasha and I, you know, talked about that. We were at the, uh, my lake house one night and we were, we were talking and it was, it was a, my anniversary and I had been through some struggles and I had written a toast to him. And part of that toast was, I'm renewing the lease with an option to back out of that lease, right? And this was our anniversary toast and everybody thought it was hysterical, but there was a lot of truth to it because mm. the reality is this, the tell death do you part piece backs us into a corner where we can't really um, say what we, what we need to say because what we might need to say is that we're not happy and we want out. And that doesn't go along with what we signed up for. Mm -hmm. So it makes us feel like a failure and no one wants to feel that way. Yeah, so true. And I wonder if you don't mind, you just said, oh, I'm, I'm way too jealous for that. That surprises me. I like, I'm like, you seem so damn confident. And so jealousy actually maybe helped me think through this. I think of jealousy as being an insecurity. Um, it's not, you know, I think when you, when you've been through what I've been through in terms of going outside of the marriage mm -hmm. and the betrayal that comes along with that and the fact that it wasn't a dialogue that, you know, we had had prior to, you know, executing. <laughs> That's very official words. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, it, it left me feeling uncomfortable and um, insecure in my my interpersonal relationships with men. And so, you know, that's something that I I've consistently have to work on that I've carried with me. And I think so many women get this. I don't care if you're 20 or 50. Um, you know, at some point, you will understand what it means to be betrayed that way. And it affects us on such a deep level because I think that we connect on such a deep level. When we give our hearts to someone women typically, it, we're all in, mm -hmm. you know, like once we decide to make that commitment, it's like all barriers are gone. Any wall that we might have is gone. And so when that is shattered, that wall comes immediately back up. And then it sort of, as an adult, you just begin to chip away. Okay, I got to get back to where I was so that I can be 100% trusting again, because how am I going to give myself to anybody else ever again if I don't feel like I can break down that that wall, mm. and it's a lot of work. I think actually, as you were talking, the thing that probably trips a lot of us up is, I wanna get back to where I was. And the truth is, if you've just had a heartbreaking experience, you're never gonna go back to where you were because you are a different human now. You have had your heart broken. And so I think it actually could be more powerful to go, how do I use this to be better than who I was? Right, right, and, and it's definitely been something that I don't think I would take back. As I said, mm. had Jason, and I not gone through what we went through, I don't think, it, it's just another layer of who I am today that I'm, I'm kind of proud of. It's like a badge of, you know, I went through war and there's some injuries. <laughs> and you, you got know? the medal to prove it. Yeah, <laughs> but now I feel differently about a lot of things that I couldn't have, have felt differently about, like this institution of marriage and relationships, how I look at them now and how I want to be and how I aspire to have more, a deeper connection mm -hmm. than I had because 
I went through it. So for me now moving forward, that's all it's about. Um, I had to have that experience um, for someone like me, I think, to learn from it. Mm, so true. And the experience, um, the experience can be beautiful. Obviously, like you said, very heartbreaking. In making the decision to leave, was um, there any shame around it from other people? None whatsoever. Um, I had a great support system. Um, very much so. My family was a great support system. My friends that rallied around me were a great support system. And I would say it took me the better part of five years to fully recover. Um, you know, now, full circle moment, my ex-husband is remarried. I've embraced the woman that he's with, um, who happens to be the woman that he had an affair with. Um, you know, I didn't speak to to her or meet her for the first three years of, of their relationship after, you know, we broke up. So I get her. I understand why he chose her. She's quite similar to me in many facets. Um, yes, she's the younger, newer model. However, all the same things and dreams and beliefs and ideas that I had when I was her age, she has. And I think the work that he had to do and the reason they probably connected during our marriage was had everything to do with him not feeling big enough and full enough. So he had to find that 28-year-old version of me again to make him feel big enough and important enough because I had grown and I didn't make him feel big enough anymore, you know? And now he, now he gets it. Just have to take a moment, holy smokes. I've got so many questions, how? <laughs> and it wasn't about age. Like I've never been like, oh, she's hotter, younger. Like it's never about but any how, of that. How, how do you, was that natural? Because here's the thing though, the truth is a thousand percent, I would go, oh my God, I'm older. Oh my God. I'm like, yeah. I would make it about me. I really would. How did you not make it about you? I, I think it's freaking beautiful. Uh, I, I mean, I, I won't say in the beginning that I, you know, I, I didn't have moments of that, but I really, the second I understood who she was, I went, oh my God, this has everything to do with him. This, he's meeting me all over again because he required that because he hadn't done the work. He required what I gave him in the beginning of, of our relationship when I was 25 all over again because he lost that pedestal moment of the woman in his life putting him on a consistent pedestal. Now, he's had so much growth since then, and I think he acknowledges all of that. But what I don't think he still fully acknowledges is how similar her and I actually are. The 28-year-old version of Tracy is very much, um, sim not exactly, but sim very, very much similarities between the two of us in terms of how we adored him and put him on a pedestal. Um, the pedestal just chipped away and chipped away until there was not one left. And that left someone who needed that in order to breathe alone. So it makes sense. Like I get it now. I know why he did what he did. And that makes it a lot easier to forgive him, move on, and, and understand. But I also have a, a man in, you know, him in my life that is doing the work to sort of understand that a little bit better. And, it, you know, we chip away at it, but, you know, we're in a really good place. And to me, that feels really good. I sort of feel like we're not a lot of, not a lot of women that have been through something similar to that can walk away from it and a few years later be having dinner with us as a family with the new wife and myself and the kids, and we all know what went down, and we've recovered from it, and we're stronger because of it. And that's, I think, pretty fucking cool. Dude, it's so fucking cool, because you could have postured. Oh yeah, I, and I did. You know, in my own, on my own journey back to like a healthy space around it, and figuring out what it was really about, and, and doing the work that I've done, yeah. But it took a minute. It didn't happen overnight. Right. But how do you, how do you then greet her? So 
the, what, no, like number 762 reasons why I freaking love you is you're such a woman's woman. You're like, I have women's backs. I fucking love that about you, girl. So someone who is so supportive of other women, when you see a woman that has an affair with a married man, you don't point the finger at her. You didn't say, oh my God, she's the bitch and you're going to fucking mess with me and my family. You didn't, at least now. At I don't now. Know, I'd love to hear if you did. Actually. I did. Okay. I definitely did. I had, um, I, I wouldn't, I, she might say I was vindictive. <laughs> but no, if you um, don't mind sharing, because here's the thing, God, like it's really important for me to say this. Some people will stay in that space having this tension, yeah. and having this friction for the rest of their lives. The children grow up in a toxic environment. Like Not can, healthy. Exactly. So if you don't mind being very honest and taking totally. us through, if you actually were vindictive, because to your point, you even said, five years later, the fact that you guys can all have dinner together is so fucking cool, but I need to know how you got there. Like yeah. the real truth of how the fuck you went from, my husband's had an affair, to now I'm having dinner with a woman. I don't like feeling unresolved about dysfunction in my life forever. Mm -hmm. There's a period of time where I can sit with something and go, I just need to sit with this for a minute and really process this and not be reactive, but be fully invested in how I feel about it before I respond. It took me a little longer <laughs> than I cared to you know, say um, as it comes to this marriage and, and what happened between Jason and I. Um, you know, when it first went down, I was, I was angry. Um, my family was angry and, and I would have, I would have gone so far as to say, he's going to do the same thing to you. I, I, mm -hmm. I truly believed it. And I was very unhealthily tapped into like, I was in a drain and I just kept going down. Um, and in fairness, I think I had to go through that. I had to go through that anger phase. I was vindictive. I was miserably unhappy. Um, it was it was a bizarre time in my life. And then I, I took space from it. I didn't see them for a long time. I didn't communicate with, uh, I, I communicated with my ex-husband as it related to the children and that was kind of it. And I went, well, this isn't, working either for me. I don't like this. I don't like feeling like someone that I spent the better part of half my life with, who I know better than his family and he knows me intimately in that sense. Like I can't live in this space of let's have fake communication about our children and, and keep it moving. And I don't think that he wanted that either. So I started to re-engage as did he. Um, and there was bumps in the road you know, because we had, we didn't have boundaries and we had disconnected mm -hmm. for a while. So the, the going from the anger to the disconnect to the re-engagement, that part was challenging because we had to now have new boundaries. We're not married anymore. How do we define that? Like, I have to have respect for your new relationship. How do I get past that? And once I started recognizing that, that that piece of it was missing, and that's why our dynamic was, the re-engagement was not going as well as either of us wanted it to. That's when I finally said, it's time for me to sit down with wow. your partner. And we picked, you know, we picked a day, and it was like five days and counting, four days, <laughs> 48 hours, you know? Yeah. And I was ready. I really wasn't nervous about it at that oh. point. I was really ready to have like a not angry conversation, but a healthy conversation. And we sat together for three hours. Um, we had some wine, we had some lunch, and we just talked. And, you know, she obviously took accountability, um, which I think was nice to hear, mm -hmm. but it wasn't, um, necessarily the most important piece of the puzzle. We spoke about how can we move forward in a healthy way and sort of be the defining moment of how we all envision sort of moving forward um, as a family. And that was something we kind of, we both agreed we wanted to be proud of. Like, wouldn't that be cool if we mm -hmm. could be, come from a totally fucked up place and then come full circle 
and spend holidays together, enjoy each other's company, support each other, um, be there for my children when I can't be um, as their stepmom, all of these things. And that's what we put into the conversation. I said, it's gonna take a minute. And she agreed. I said, it's not like all of a sudden we're gonna be you know, under the tree together. <laughs> And then lo and behold, we were this Christmas, <laughs> what you really Christmas know? morning, mimosas and, you know, opening presents over at their house. And I had a great time, but we put that out into the universe is how we sort of envisioned. Wouldn't it be fucking cool if we could redefine what this looks like for every family that's been through what we've been through and felt like there's n it's never going to be healthy again. It's going to be screwed up for these kids forever. I really wanted to see if we could do that. And so we're doing it. Fuck, oh, that's such an amazing breakdown. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for taking me through that. And also talk about what you're freaking to uh, teaching your daughters to yeah. not be in a relationship if it doesn't work, to not hold on to a grudge, to, to actually go through a grief, but then be able to come out with uh, beauty and dignity and respect at the end. It's so fucking powerful. I have too many people in my life, and I don't know if you do, where they've divorced. 30 years later, they still can't be in the same room with each other. And I have like people in my family that are adults, and they're the kids, and they're like, oh yeah, shit, mom and dad are gonna be in the same room today because it's my 40th birthday. And it's yeah. like, it's such a unhealthy way it's to so live. It's so shitty. And it's so like, again, it goes back to like old traditions and like, oh, you, obviously if you're gonna get divorced, like the, all bets are off. And mm -hmm. why can't we recover properly? Why can't we sort of be in charge of our destiny and what, what post-divorce looks like? Why can't, and I've always wanted to talk about that and and I've been able to talk about it with a lot more honesty mm. since coming clean about what I really went through and what we both went through as a couple and sort of the recovery of that. Because really the story that was told was I was a workaholic and he couldn't take it anymore. And that was that. Yeah. That's, it's way more complicated and relationships always are. Oh, yeah. And you even use the word recovery. And what's interesting is it wasn't like you were bullshitting recovery. Like, because what I mean is like, let's just do face for the kids. When the kids are around, we play polite. But That's then, bullshit. It's such bullshit. First of all, kids are the most intuitive creatures on the planet. If you think that you're fooling your kids, you've got it twisted. Mm -hmm. They see it all. They mm -hmm. know everything. They know, you walk in, and I'm terrible at not wearing my emotions on my sleeve. And even when I've done my very best to fake it, like I am authentic, I, it like b comes out of my pores, right? And, and for the families out there that feel like they've got their kids fooled, when they wake up in therapy at 20, when you finally do decide to pull the trigger after years of like a bullshit facade, it's gonna screw those kids up far more mm. than living authentically that you're in an unhealthy relationship that's not working for either one of you and you're choosing to leave it. That's how you want your kids to be in their relationships. A thousand percent. And even if you don't have kids, how to fully move on mm. if you're holding something to the past. I honestly don't see how you can if you've still got this like wound that you haven't healed. And so um, in healing it, it's not even the pretend heal, right? Or like the passive aggressiveness, right? You could have been so damn passive aggressive and like do these jabs, right? Like we said at the beginning of the interview, you were even saying about your friend when you do the little jabs. It's like the jabs are the thing that people don't necessarily call you on. The jabs are the things you mm. can probably do for 10 years, right? And nobody, everyone will like feel it, yeah. but no one will actually say anything. But there's no way I could think of you being able to heal. That's the thing. I think. You know, with everything, there's like, the, the, what are the five steps? Like, you have to grieve. Mm. You have to, it's okay to be angry. Like, you got, like, the people that are, like, faking their way through all of those emotions, even as it relates to business, mm. like, it's okay to fail and fall on your face. You should experience that loss as it exactly is and as you're experiencing it not push it down the line because that doesn't serve you. Mm. That doesn't allow you to get back up again and feel stronger. The, I get that question all the time. Like, you know, how did you get the way? I said, because I fell on my face so many times because I did this alone. 
I didn't really have that many people that I related to that I could look up to. So every time I fell on my face, I did cry and I did scream and I did have too many tequilas because I lost the big deal. And I, I did have a lot of things to say about it. But the truth is, by virtue of experiencing that authentically, then I was able to get back up and move on. And I think divorce and going through a breakup or going through any sort of trauma like that is similar. If you don't deal with the symptoms and experience the emotion of the loss and the anger and everything that goes along with it, then how the hell are you going to be able to move on? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you know, Jason and his wife were on the receiving end of, <laughs> of my process. But it's, it's, it's brought us to where we are today. So I don't, I wouldn't, I don't think either of them and, and, and myself, I don't think we'd, any of us would take any of it back. All right, so in your growth, and maybe you have, and I'd really be curious to talk about this, in your growth, Sometimes, like for me, I was the stay-at-home wife, submissive, do things for my husband. And then when I went into business, I went so fucking hardcore the other way that my husband was like, hey, yeah. you know, like I kind of miss the sweetness in you. Right. And so I realized, oh shit, I actually have to pull back a bit because what I did is I just went really tough, hardcore alpha in every aspect of my life. And so because I'd already been married, I had this, you know, dynamic with my husband. I actually, he was like, look, I actually really, I understand why you have to be hard in business, right? Like you're, 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 it's like you're going to war every day. He's like, so I totally get it. But at the same time, what you're doing is bringing that harsh, harshness back and you've lost this sweet nurturing side of you that I loved. And I was like, oh, actually, I totally understand what he means. And I did go too hard. Now with you and you saying, you were the one that was looking up to your husband on the pedestal. And over time, as you started to get more powerful, more mm. strong, more badass, more ownership of who you are and where you want to go, and you were chipping away at that stool, and now you weren't looking up to him. But earlier you said about your current boyfriend, mm. where you're basically the hard nut, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I'll use my own words. You're the one that's the boss, the fucking lady, and we're doing this. But also you're looking to him to be like, but hang on a minute, I want you to also handle it. How are you like going to navigate the two of like, you're a fucking badass, but actually you do want people to lead as well. He naturally is a leader. And I think the difference between uh, the younger generations and the 20, I mean, I'm with a 28 year old. Yeah, sorry, I forgot <laughs> to actually give context there. Uh, but I think men in his generation are a little bit different. I think they're inspired by women um, like myself. And I think they're, and that's why, you know, Year over year, every single year, you're seeing more and more women in relationships with younger men. So I think there is a different level of confidence that, you know, my husband's generation, ex-husband's generation mm -hmm. did not have, um, where, again, this comes down to wage gap equality. Like, each generation is experiencing it differently. Um, and obviously, because I'm, I'm my age, you know, the way I grew up, it was just a gap. Period. The end. I mean, I was raised in a household where my dad was the boss. My mom was also a boss, but at home. Mm -hmm. And that was very, that was very, very clear. And it was very black and white. And I think Eric is a great example of, of being a part of a generation where, you know, you can look up to a, a woman at making money and someone that's successful and be like, go for it. And he's always empowered me and we've been together for three years. And I will say, he knows when I'm falling off the ledge. What do you mean by falling off the ledge? Like whether I'm exhausted mm -hmm. because I've worked, you know, four weeks in a row, 80 or 90 hour weeks, and I've been traveling for work and I'm coming home depleted with like nothing left to give. Mm -hmm. Are moments where, you know, for example, I came home from a work trip a couple months back and there was a bath run for me, a glass of wine, and sushi was already at the house, like, waiting. And so I, like, came in, I got in the tub, and I was like, mm. you know, these are things that, you know, maybe financially he can't, you know, fly me on a private jet to another foreign country and, you know, give me that type of experience. But, but the simplicity in what he is able to give me from an emotional standpoint and from a giving standpoint was so much more actually about me mm -hmm. um, and my well-being than it was about I'm going to be showy and take you here, there, and buy you this handbag or send you on this trip. 
and you know to me that's it's it's good for my soul it's it's what i need in my life to be to feel balanced i don't know if i would find that in someone my age that's fascinating. I don't know if you know this, but um, one of the big things in relationships and knowing whether it's going to su succeed or not is if the partner feels seen or not. Yeah. I mean, I, I totally believe that. I mean, I think that's a big part of it. You know, I'm very supportive of his career. Um, he works nonstop. Um, but I think what he brings to my life and in terms of giving back, and I don't think either of us ever thought that this relationship was going to be as what it was. It's blossomed into something that I think neither of us had anticipated. But out of that has come something so beautiful. And, and whether or not it's, you know, till death do you part, or however long we make a choice to be together, um, the, those moments are so important. Like he brings me back down to earth and reminds me that I need to sleep. I need to take care of myself. I need to do things that are good for my well-being and my health and my wellness versus, you know, being out in the public eye at the right restaurants and, you know, having the right handbag or any of that shit, which mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I see a lot of people, particularly in L.A., that are focused on all of those things. Mm. Did you have to face judgment when you started dating him because he was so much younger than you? Absolutely. How did you deal with that? I told him to eat shit. <laughs> <laughs> True. Fuck yeah, you I did, did, I, did. I, I really, I really did not give a fuck. I, I just, I just didn't. And not at all. No. Even people close to you. No. No, I really didn't because if you know Eric and the people that know me intimately that have an actual relationship with him and made an effort to really get to know him, know who he is. He's a, he's a deep down an incredibly solid human being, sometimes more so than, you know, the men that are my age. And so when you have a foundation like that for like a solid human um, the people that I said know us intimately are like, he's a good guy. Now, whether or not you guys end up together forever is, is, is not the point. You're in a relationship that's much healthier than the relationships you've been in in the past. And we like this for you. You're healthy. You're happy. You've never felt better. You're rested. I'm not going out all the time. I'm, I'm more successful. I'm more productive. Like this is because the man in my life is there supporting me and lifting me up and, and also sort of drawing a line saying, I don't really think that you need to like, we need to go out tonight. Mm. Like I think actually it would be nice if we just spent some time alone. And I'm like, okay, great. You know, it's nice to kind of have that and, and sort of be brought back down. Mm. How are you able to build trust back again from your last relationship and now being in this new relationship? Honestly, I, I, uh, that's again a daily sort of stay in your body, try not to go back to the trauma of what that was and trust that if it does happen again, you'll make the decision that's right for you and you won't wait five years to do it, mm. right? Um, I don't think in relationships we can ever fully trust that someone isn't going to do something outside of the bounds of what your agreement is between the two of you. Um, How are you going to trust yourself then to hold true to that? Well, I guess I have to find out, right? <laughs> well, like, hopefully you don't, but... Right? But yeah. assuming that I'm presented with that scenario again, there won't be... Uh, um, uh, there won't be second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth chances yeah the reason why I ask is I think that that's something that a lot of people struggle with when they've been cheated on it's like wow I don't trust myself anymore I don't trust myself that I'm going to be able to spot it that I'm going to be able to leave again or that I'm not going to be able to lose myself again I in totally a relationship. relate to that on every level I think that any woman or man that's been through that and has been truly betrayed and and really caught off guard um, is a really difficult recovery process to fully trust again. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if I'm 100% there. I don't know if I ever will be, um, but I have to try and I have to give myself to it fully. And the only way to find out if you're capable of it is by virtue of experiencing it. Mm -hmm. I heard you say though that the judgment always came from women. Yeah, you know, um, this is an interesting topic because so for so long, you know, being sort of the feminist that I am, 
I've looked at men as being the reason uh, that we are not, you know, equal on all fronts. And over the course of the last few years, I've done some soul searching on that and just even looking at the women around me, um, women across the board on social media channels, and I've recognized that you know, the competitive nature between women to get to the top is one piece of the puzzle. And then I also think, again, my generation, the generation in front of me and the generation in front of that generation are all still, everybody's behind their little computer on social media sitting in the dark judging. Mm -hmm. I think the, the younger generations are a little bit um, different. Uh, but I think women typically are our biggest challenge today. I think there's a, a problem with the way that we all grew up and, and it's very difficult to break out of those patterns because we were raised in that. At, at 47 years old, for me to be who I am every single day and be this feminist, uh, it's like work. I've had to like challenge myself in certain areas and be like, well, why can't? I remember I hired, here's an example. I hired a new agent on my team by the name of Shelby. Shelby I met in Mexico at a, a 50th birthday party. She's 25 or 20, she was 25 or 26 at the time. Gorgeous model, you know, great on social media and Instagram, but a model nonetheless. And a couple years later, she came to me and wanted to sell real estate. Smart girl, totally has the charisma for it. But you know what was the first thing I did? I started saying, well, she's gonna have to like, stop modeling and doing the whole bikini thing mm -hmm. on social media to be taken seriously. And then I was like, no, no. Do you know what I'm saying? Like I, I did the same fucking thing. And, and by the way, every, you know, the people that surrounded me in business were like, ooh, you know, she's really gonna have to reel back on, you know, cause she couldn't possibly be successful in real estate and wear a bikini. Now granted there's, I'm like, you're not gonna wear a bikini to a listing appointment. But perception is everything. And I said, well, then if I'm going to stand here and say that all of the things that I'm saying about being a feminist and I should be able to wear a half top and, and make, you know, $10 million a year, then I have to also get behind the women underneath me that are doing the same thing and actually elevate them, support them, and make them into the little bosses that they are. And that's exactly what she's doing. I, I said to her, I even told her, you know, pretty much this story. And I said, there's no reason for you to have two separate accounts. Mm -hmm. You do you. And, you know, as long as you show up to work and give it 110%, I don't care what perception of you, what the perception of you is online. I care that you know what you're talking about when you walk into the room, that you're connected and that you are ready to talk to this client about their home and how you can best service them. At the end of the day, that's all that matters. And she has that in spades. Now, if she did not have that charisma or that ability to connect, that would be a different story. But she had it. So the one thing that was holding her back was that she was a bikini model. And not just a bikini model, but you know, but there were a lot of, of these pictures of her online. Well, that's bullshit. Why can't she be both? And so I had to really second guess myself and remind myself that I, it doesn't stop right there. And I think that's a big part of where the older generations look at some of, even me. They look at me and say, you, you can't wear that and be successful at the same time. Well, why the hell not? I'm actually currently doing it, you know? And I think that's part of what my new messaging is. It's talking to women about really supporting each other because I think that's kind of like, it's kind of bullshit. Like we say we support each other to a point, but then don't, don't be too feminine. Don't be too comfortable with your own body. You're still a mom. What kind of mom are you if you dress like that? All of these types of comments are completely farcical when it comes to, you know, talking about women online. And, and it, it, it's made me absolutely bananas crazy. So now it's, it's like all I, I want to focus on and talk about because 
we can't point the finger at men forever for holding each other back. We have to elevate each other and be able to be all of the things that we are. And that includes boobs and a butt and a pair of heels and however we feel like doing our hair and makeup. That's what makes us women. We, have, we are in completely different than men. And we have to celebrate all of those differences, not just how they fit into being an old version of becoming a feminist. I love your energy around this. I feel the same and I don't know how to talk about it because I have a freaking show called Women of Impact. My whole life is dedicated to supporting women, elevating women, helping women. And yet people sometimes still watch this show, homie. And there's mm. people across the sea and they just, in the comments, rip the, the woman apart or rip me apart. What the hell's up with this woman's hair? Or like, why does she <coughs> talk in a squeaky voice? Um, I had one uh, guest who was a doctor. She was giving advice on how women can help with their hormones and self-care, right? So her whole life is dedicated to helping women and their hormones. Mm. And the comments is because she wore a crop top. Story Literally, of my life. Women in the freaking comments. Oh, guys, I read the comments. I read the freaking <laughs> comments. <laughs> In the comments, they were like, I can't take this woman seriously because she's showing her belly. How can she, if she wasn't showing her boobs, I would take her advice more seriously. And I'm like, you're, you're watching- the reason we are totally fucked. Like that is the bottom line. Because at the end of the day, if we're the ones elevating each other, and call it 50 per, and, and I'm shooting statistics out without any, so 50% of us are, are really truly elevating women as a whole, but the other 50% are saying, I'm, I'm here to elevate you if you do it the old fashioned way. Hmm, mm-hmm. But outside, you sound like you're smart and you have your shit together and you've done all the things and here's the list of all of your accomplishments. I'm here for that so long as you do it the way I say you should do it because traditionally that's the way it was done. Yeah, as long as you do it within my value system. Right. And that's where it's like, it's so damn important for me to keep talking about this sort of thing and even with the show, I try to have as many diverse types of women as I possibly can because here's what I'm not saying. Every woman should go and have business and be a badass and crush it in work. No, 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 no. What life do you want and what the hell is holding you back? I got you. That's what this show is about. Right. And so even with what we're talking about today, it's been about relationships, it's been about business, it's been about uh, friendships. But the whole point is how the hell, Tracy Tudor, do you stand up and be a freaking like strong woman on a daily basis when you're getting all this stuff coming at you? Whether this stuff is other women hating on you, whether it's you know, you finding out that your husband's cheated on you, whatever that stuff is, how the hell do you keep showing up? Because a lot of women don't. You've just shared over an hour, God knows how long, of all the tactics and tips that you do. That's what I want to keep focusing on, right? Hey, you at home, stop writing a comment about, oh my God, I can't believe she dates someone that's 20 years younger. Why do you care? And it's so damn disheartening, girl. It's so damn disheartening to think that because of our own belief system, if it doesn't align with what you, you know, if what you do doesn't align with my belief system, then I'm only going to tear you down. Why not freaking support? Yeah, I mean, I think what I find is it only inspires me to keep doing it. The haters on you inspires you. It only inspires me to keep having the dialogue, keep dressing the way I want to dress, whether that's in a crop top, which I get a lot of shit for, or uh, you know, wearing a skirt that's, whatever that looks like to the women, if I keep doing it, they will eventually tie, as long as I'm, <laughs> as long as I'm still speaking um, from the same mindset, as long as I'm still successful, as long as my messaging is no different, eventually they'll kind of go, okay, well, I guess she's as smart as I thought she was. And I guess the, the top that she's wearing is sort of irrelevant, isn't it? And, and mm. that's sort of my mission to continue to, if I stop doing what I'm doing, then that dialogue isn't had until the next woman that comes along that maybe doesn't have the balls to stand up for themselves quite yet because they're a little bit younger. And so then you're always conforming. And if we don't stand up and not conform to what these old ideals were, then we're never gonna actually change the whole system. Mm. And so to me, 
it's always going to be continue. Like, y'all inspire me. The more you talk shit, the more I'm going to continue to be exactly who I am, exactly, say exactly what I'm thinking all of the time and just be 100% authentic. And it seems to be working. So, fuck yeah, girl. And I am, I don't want to presume but I do feel like sometimes a lot of hate just comes from insecurity, right? It's like, I, I wish I had the confidence to dress like that. I wish I had the confidence to just say, yeah, I'm divorced. I'm going to go after a guy who's 20 years younger than me. Like, and so because maybe people don't have the confidence, the, um, the flip side is to actually say why it's wrong because now they don't, you don't necessarily have to. Yeah, I mean, I think we all, we all know that, right? Like, you know, social media trolls, uh, it, you know, they're all insecure. And that's a very easy way to compartmentalize them, right? And so that we can move on with mm -hmm. our day. But the truth is, we have to, the, social media is how people communicate. It is a big part of how we're all out there and having success that we're having. And if we don't continue to have the dialogue on how to shift that narrative, then we're not going, we're going to continue to have sort of these internet trolls that actually are valued. There's value there. There's a reason these different blogs and, and social media accounts are created. There's a reason bots are, you know, these are things mm -hmm. are successful because people buy into it. And what we don't want to see is people buying into it anymore. So in order, in my opinion, in order to stop that bullshit, we have to keep stepping up, keep stepping out of our comfort zones, continue to battle this in an effective way so that, you know, we change the actual dynamic. We shift their opinion. And more often than not, when I do have a dialogue with a troll for whatever reason, not every time. But more often than not, they'll say, wow, I just never really thought that you would actually respond to this. Sorry. And I'm not, I'm not emotionally affected by it either way, but it's more of a shift of I'd rather connect with you and explain to you that the reason I will continue to do this is so that I can shift your mindset about mm -hmm. it. I'm not here to upset you. I'm here to shift your mindset that I can be many, many things, and those things include sexiness, funny, and really fucking smart at the same time. Like, why can't we have all three? Why if, why, if you're smart and successful as a woman in business, do you have to be one note? I'm over it. Where's that um, fine line between um, helping them, right? Like, actually, I think that if I say this, maybe I'm opening a door that you haven't seen before and defending yourself. I mean, I think in some cases, you know, when, they, when it's tapped into my relationship with my children, um, uh, I'll, I definitely have a little bit of a different messaging messaging surrounding that. But my kids are also old enough to um, have their own lines on social media. And like I said, they're little feminists in the making. And so they can speak quite eloquently um, and in a way that has worked, I think, wonders. Because obviously I can also not be a good mom because I work too hard and I dress too sexy. So therefore I'm setting a bad example for my girls. Both my girls are unbelievably successful in their own right. They're good kids. They get good grades. They're on an incredible path of their own and they're thriving. And they'll chime in when they feel like it on their own. And, and I, I can't tell you the amount of times I've read some of Juliet's responses um, on social media to different people and I'm blown away with what she's been able to say. And I think, you know, so are my followers, candidly. Mm -hmm. Like, wow, this little 17-year-old has uh, quite a bit to say and is really effective. I mean, God help everyone when she's 25. You know what I mean? She learned the lessons from her mom. Yeah. But that's the thing. It's like really having the skills to defend yourself in certain moments or having the skill to let something roll off your back. Like, if this such, and this is really, you know, beautiful full circle of where we started from. I find it even now sometimes difficult for myself. Um, and a lot of it, that's why I'm actually leaning in a lot into health. Because I'm like, if I'm just tired, if I haven't eaten, if I'm overwhelmed, I'm way less likely to let something roll off my back and then like defend myself if someone comes at me, like, come at me, bro. Yeah. Right? Like, I'm more likely to do that on days that I'm not feeling great and exhausted versus on days that I'm feeling confident because I've had a great sleep, I've had a great day, whatever. Like, in those moments, I'm more likely to let it roll off my back. Yeah. I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, 
because this has now become more recently a mission of mine, I'm conscious of that. So despite how I'm feeling that day, I'll really try to shift. I'm beginning a shift in how I, how I react to mm. these types of comments because my, my bigger goal is to sort of have women realize that by, we're holding ourselves back yeah. by doing this to each other. Um, we're our, we should be our biggest advocates, not the reason that we're still not there. Yeah, and even in what you were just saying, it's like, if someone said, I can't take you seriously because you wear heels and you wear low cut tops versus you can't be a good mum because you wear heels and low cut tops. I assume that the impact it has on you to your point of like when it's to my kids, obviously they're older now, but when they were younger, did you have more of that like protection? Like, okay, now you've actually triggered the thing inside me that's not gonna, I can't let this roll off my back. Yeah, of course. I mean, they're my babies and you know, I feel very responsible, for, uh, along with Jason, for the women that they're becoming. And, uh, and, you know, when your kids become teenagers, it's like a whole different world. Like, you're lucky enough to be graced by their presence. They have ideas of their own. They have their own thoughts. They, you know, you're like old. And they have their own vision of how they want their life to be. Now, I could either take that and be offended by it, but honestly, I embrace that in them. And so when they were younger, these types of comments would get at me a little bit more. But now, because they follow me so closely in my business and, and really what I am all about is women empowering other women, they're like my little empowerment chicks. So Scarlett a little bit less so. And again, she's only 14, but Juliet's like 17 going on like, 30. <laughs> She's just like, listen, here's how I'm going to put it to you ladies. And she'll, you know, chime in on her own. And, and that sort of affirms that without me having to say it, that the little women that I have raised, I've raised really well. And they're making good decisions. They know how to speak on behalf of themselves. They know how to elevate themselves and they know how to be heard. Um, and that to me is, is, the job speaks for itself. I don't have to defend it. Mm, I love that, but because I don't have children, like the mama bear effect is very fascinating to me because every time I hear about pretty much any badass, powerful woman, it's always just like, well, I kind of let things slide off my back. If people are insulting me, if people are doing this to me, like we always kind of let the things go when it's happening to you. But when it happens to someone in your life or someone you really care about, like I can't even remember the stats. I'm going to pull something out of my ass right now. But it's something like 70% of women are more likely to fight for their colleagues' pay raise than their own pay raise. Um, because you're more likely as a woman to advocate for someone else over yourself. What would you suggest if you weren't a mother of like, or in fact anybody, of how we start to actually advocate for ourselves first? Right. I mean, it's so true. I was watching this Korean new show. You guys got to say it. it's called Glory. Mm. And it's about, it's, it's obviously in South Korea, but it, it's about a young girl who was bullied by some high school students and she spends the better part of 20 years coming back for revenge. That is really good. <laughs> but wow. there's this instinctual thing, I think, that happens with women. And I, I don't know, maybe not for every woman, but for me, since I was a kid, if there is an underdog, I am their protector. If there is someone that isn't getting paid equally, then I'm coming to bat for them. Like, I've just always been that way. And I used to attribute it to just being a woman. And that's part of just like our makeup and who we are. But um, I definitely have not advocated for myself early enough as a young you know, entrepreneur coming into business. Mm. It took me until now to finally start beginning to, you know, advocate for myself in the last, call it, eight years of my career. But the first 15 years of my career, I spent advocating for everyone else. Mm -hmm. and, and that's just the truth. Um, and so, you know, again, the reason why I wrote the book, um, and, the re and you and I had talked about this before, I really wanted young women to connect to it because I didn't have that book or that mentor that I understood or that I related to because, you know, they said fuck every so often. I was like, oh, 
they make mistakes. They're not just polished 100% of the time. They speak with authenticity. I didn't really have anyone to look up to growing up. So I fell on my face 150 times and had to figure out how to get back up and, and become successful. I don't want the 20 somethings of the world to, to have to go through what I went through. Like we can cut that in half by, you know, talking to each other, supporting each other, advocating for each other and for ourselves, starting, you know, outside of college or even outside of high school, um, rather than when you're 38. If your partner or parent or anyone you know in your life is a verbally abusive narcissist, then click here right now. Narcissists have to have control. And this is to do with their ego. They have very fragile sense of self. They have very low self-esteem. They feel more comfortable being in control. And they didn't feel this way when they were...